Okay. Perfect. So thanks very much for, for inviting me um, to present to you. It's, it's quite a, a challenging environment without being able to see faces. Um, and so I would like to ask um, Sereni and Elzek, can you please watch um, the panel for hands? Please, I really would like you to ask questions if you don't understand. Um, it would be quite nice to get some engagement in a, in a workshop situation. So I, I'm sure many of you are on different phases of your, your MED work, from some of you in protocol development, some of you might be writing up. Um, and so it's, as I say, it's quite difficult without seeing the faces to know exactly where you are. Um, what I didn't include in my bio is that I have supervised, oh goodness, I think about 20 MEDs um, and a whole lot of MFILs. So I've, worked, I've walked this path with a lot of registrars um, previously. So I've tried to pick up on some of the issues that I've, I've seen um, in that journey, but it is an exciting journey. I just want to, sorry, my screen is just doing slightly funny things. I just want to make people go away. Okay, so just to, to start looking at, at aspects of evidence-based practice as why we are doing the research at all, so some of you may have heard of, of David Sackett. So David Sackett is really the father of evidence-based medicine. Um, and he described it as the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of the, using the current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And you know, we have to ask the question, so what does it matter? Well, we know that if we don't have good evidence, we can end up causing patient harm. And common patterns of thinking also introduce bias. So there's the whole expert opinion story where you've heard the people saying, well, I've done this the same way for so many years, I know this works. And actually 20 years down the line, people start saying, wait a minute, maybe it doesn't actually work. There's also a very, very wide variation in current clinical practice. So what we do at Red Cross, for example, might not be the same as they're doing at Barra. Um, and it's how do we put that together to make sure that the current practice we are, we are giving is actually the best practice for the child. We also know that um, as we leave medical school and as we leave our training institutions, unfortunately, our knowledge declines with the gray matter over time. And we can't be experts in everything. So some, sometimes we'll, you know, we'll see a patient coming in and we haven't seen that condition for the last 15 years. Is it appropriate to still be using the knowledge that you gained 15 years ago, or do you need to actually check what's happening now? What is the current evidence saying? Because we also know that evidence changes, and as new evidence emerges, our thinking also has to change. We need to be flexible as healthcare providers. We can't carry on doing the same thing as we've always done and expect the results to improve as well. So evidence-based practice is about solving clinical problems. And I think that's really important because people often see the research process as being completely separate to the clinical process. Um, and certainly the MED project is often seen as just you know, a hoop that you have to jump through and you don't enjoy it and then there's no purpose in it. But actually there's a really good purpose, especially if you choose your topic appropriately. Because this is really about solving a clinical problem, finding where the gaps are in our knowledge and trying to answer those questions. The other thing we hear quite often is there's no evidence supporting X treatment. Well, there's actually no such thing as no evidence because we also have to place research within the broader context of evidence-based practice. And research is actually only one part of evidence-based practice. Because we don't always have adequate research knowledge, this is also hinged on aspects of clinical experience. There's your expert opinion. So we do need to listen to the people that have been around for a while. And we also have to consider patient preference, which we also often don't think about. So I often think of evidence-based practice as a three-legged stool. And so for the stool to stand, all three legs must be strong. Any gaps, any breakages, and the chair falls over. So the focus today is on the clinical research leg of that stool. But we have to remember that we must put it all together. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about, about the research process and I looked at the program. And so really I'm focusing on this aspect of the research pr process. It's about selecting your topic, narrowing it down, um, devising a research question, choosing the right research design and considering aspects of data analysis, et cetera, the, the methods to write a decent research proposal. 
Because really, you cannot do good research if your proposal is not sound, and if your methodologies are not sound, and if you haven't really thought it through very, very carefully. For me, this is the, probably the most important aspect of getting your research right, is starting out with a solid foundation. So the first thing is to choose your topic. Um, now, I know some of you probably get given topics. Um, some of you may, may get a range, a choice of topics that you must then select from. And there are obviously different reasons to choose a topic. Um, and usually you start out quite broad. You think about the general area you're interested in. So it's often the rotation you happen to be on when the topics are sent out. And that's fine. Um, it might be that you choose your topic based on the fact on the supervisor that you want to have. But it's really a good idea to be interested, at least in the broad topic. If you're not interested and passionate about your research topic, it's really, really difficult to actually take it through to its conclusion. It becomes a chore and something that you don't enjoy. Um, and this actually can be enjoyable. So we first look at the broad area. Think about a general area you're actually interested in. And even if you have quite a good sense of the general topic, you need to read very widely to build your background knowledge and to start to narrow down your ideas. So I always suggest conducting an initial literature review to get an idea of what is already known. Where are the gaps? Um, there might be very good knowledge from America, but there's nothing from Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. And we know that our context is very different. And as you're reading, don't just skim the abstract. So read a little bit more extensively, take notes, try to identify the problems, the questions, some of the debates or contradictions um, and gaps in the literature. And your aim then is really to narrow it down from a very broad area of interest to a specific niche topic. You want to be as specific as possible in your research question for an MED. Um, as Rina said, this is not your magnum opus. This, uh, your MED should be a single question that's relatively easily answerable. So make sure now to consider the practicalities and feasibilities of your topic. How much time do you actually have for research? Um, the last minute MEDs are a challenge, but we know it usually gets to that point where you have to do things really quickly, actually, because you've left it till the last minute. Um, do you actually have access to the type yeah. of questions? Sorry, yes. Oh. Has somebody got their mic on? Okay, we're back again, sorry. Um, so the one point thing is, do you actually have enough access to the type of patient or the condition that you're interested in? Um, if it's a very rare condition, how are you going to get your patients, your participants for the study? Um, you need to ask yourself how easy or how difficult will it be to collect the data and what will it cost? Do you have access to research funding if it's necessary? And then it's really useful to phrase your specific topic as a research question. So it does need to be specific enough to be answerable. Um, for experimental studies, ideally, you should use this PICO format. Um, and for systematic reviews, the PCOT, and we're going to come back to those, those designs. So your peak, PICO is, who is your population? And be specific here. What are you interested in? Are you interested in children of a certain age, um, children with a certain condition, children from a certain socioeconomic background, for example? Um, if you are looking at an intervention, whether you're describing it or comparing it or testing it, what is that specific intervention? Um, is there a comparison? Are you comparing your intervention group to another group? Are you comparing your patient profile to another patient profile? And then what are your primary and secondary outcome measures? And that's really important to define up front. And we will come, to, come back to that. But from an analysis perspective, it's bad practice to just fish for interesting results. Um, you should really have very clear questions. I'm interested in the effect of this on this outcome. And for systematic reviews and meta-analyses, you have to add the, the T at the end, which is your type of question and type of studies that you will include in your systematic review. So I'm sorry, um, I've, I've got a specific interest in pediatric critical care and in, in um, pulmonary conditions. So my, my examples tend to be focused on those areas. Um, but you can think about your own research questions perhaps here. So some examples of research questions, um, remembering that purely descriptive research can be very different. So you might be describing the impact 
of socioeconomic status on the development of asthma in preschool South African children, for example. But you see how even with this fairly broad topic, we've narrowed it down. So I'm looking at socioeconomic status specifically. I'm looking at asthma, perhaps prevalence of asthma. I'm looking at preschool South African children. So it places it quite specifically. My objectives will then specify what do I mean by socioeconomic status, for example. How do I define asthma? Um, the other one, what are the long-term functional outcomes of survivors of critical illness during infancy in South Africa? Again, being more specific about your population. Um, the intervention here is critical illness or critical care. And the outcome is long-term functional outcome. Another one, perhaps, what is the prevalence of delirium in children in infants, or sorry, in infants less than two years of age admitted to the ICU for more than two days? Very specific again. Um, and we can carry on. We can be very specific. Um, this is a cystic fibrosis example that's fairly current at the moment. Um, they're modulators that are available in developed countries, but not in South Africa because they cost about 3 million rand a year. But we are at the moment looking to see what proportion of our population might actually be eligible for the modulator were, were they made available. So we know about our homozygous population, but actually does this modulator help our children that are heterozygous, for example, mixed race ancestry. Um, I don't know at this stage if people want to give an idea of if, if they've got research questions or research topics that they'd like to share with the group. Not sure if there's any takers. Anyone looking enthusiastic, Sereni? I'm just scanning through. Sure. Um, if anyone is struggling as well to raise their hand, there is an option for a chat. So please put your questions either in the chat or raise your hands and we will, we're really keen to involve you and to get you involved. Um, I don't see anyone for now, for tomorrow. Okay, that's fine. If you, if anybody would like to discuss it, if anybody wants to talk about how we can try and phrase your topic into a research question, again, people can also just contact me afterwards. That's fine. Yeah, so once you've got your topic, you've asked your research question, um, we now need to choose the research design. And there are literally thousands of research designs that you could choose. So a number of you will have seen this. In fact, everybody will have seen this. Clinical studies have shown. We hear it every day on the radio. We see it on social media, on TV. And we've seen it a huge amount with the COVID pandemic. When you read or hear this in support of any medical intervention or treatment, the first thing you should ask is, what kind of study was this? Before you even ask what the results actually were, what was the study? Because studies are not equally reliable. They all have different limitations, which impact on whether or how the results can actually be applied in clinical practice, if at all. So really, the main thing that clinical studies have shown actually is that people tend to believe whatever we say when we say this in front of them. And it's, you know, in order to really um, interrogate the mounds of literature that we see every day, you need to have an understanding of, of what the benefits and limitations of every research design is. So, so some of you, yes, we do yeah. have someone in the, we do have someone in the chat who's I think put through their research topic. Okay. So I think it's Dr. Leslie has written here, um, the safety and efficacy of paracetamol in the treatment of symptomatic PDA in preterm babies. I think, Dr. Leslie, is that your um, your uh, topic or your proposed topic? Is that your is that what you'd like to get some input on? Can Leslie speak? Maybe not. Um, okay, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Please do call me Brenda. I, this Professor Morrow story is a little bit freaky. Um, <laughs> so well, he's, he said yes, that is he or she, sorry, has said yes, that this is their topic and they're, they're looking for some input. There. So, so wow, Leslie, this is, a, this is um, the way that you've presented this is that of a clinical trial. So yes, I think, I think that you, you're looking at the use of paracetamol in the treatment of symptomatic PDA in pretermers is a great topic. When you talk about safety and efficacy, that is telling me that you need to have a control group, that it needs to be prospective, and that, um, you know, that there needs to be very clear um, intervention here. So in terms of standardization of dosage, for example, and perhaps use of placebo or comparator. 
So this, when you talk about issues of safety and efficacy, you're talking about a randomized control trial and a clinical trial, which for an MED level, I would be very concerned about doing. You know, it's, it's, very, it's a very big scope. It has huge challenges. So perhaps the focus at an MED level would be to describe the, the paracetamol use um, in, in, in preterm babies with symptomatic PDA. Um, in other words, if, if you are describing current practice, you can have children, you can still compare children who have received paracetamol to children who have not received paracetamol, but you, you're not using outcomes of safety and efficacy. Um, you need to be very careful about the outcomes that you choose. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Okay. But, but as a topic, it's great, but just be careful about how you're phrasing it because that's leading you through to the next step. Okay, the next one, the pathogens causing bloodstream infection in neonates in the NICU and their antibiotic sensitivities. So this sounds like a descriptive study. Um, so describing what, what are the common pathogens associated with bloodstream infection um, in NICU patients, um, and the associated sensitivities. And that's completely, that's completely reasonable. Um, so that sounds like a descriptive study. That sounds like something that could be quite feasibly done um, retro using available, routinely available data. So that's great. Does that, who was that, Kanya? Yeah, so that, sound, that sounds fantastic. So it's just, again, it's rephrasing it into a question that's setting you up for a feasible study at the other side. Okay. And you can certainly come back to your efficacy and safety for your PhD later if you want. Okay. Okay, so some of you are clearly starting out with the research. So I think from the baseline, it's absolutely essential again to understand that not all studies are created equal, equally. So this is a table of the main quantitative study designs. I'm not talking about qualitative research, that's a whole different ball game. So this is a table of quantitative study designs. And you can see that the strength of the conclusions increases as the rigor of the study increases. So a single observational study is just that. It's one study, it's one observation. And if you look at a single study in isolation, you're only seeing one piece of a big jigsaw puzzle, one interpretation of the research question, one idea about how to run a scientific experiment. So that's why you can make the strongest conclusions by synthesizing lots of data, lots of puzzle pieces into a big complete puzzle, a systematic review and meta-analysis, which really combines lots of good but small studies into one big robust study. But that's not to say that the lower ranked study designs are bad. They may in many cases be the most appropriate for your context, for your research question, and many are a great way to start out in research. Um, so for MEDs, it really, I strongly recommend that you stick to feasible observational studies largely um, that can be feasibly conducted in a relatively short period of time. But with that, you have to understand what you can and cannot conclude from the results of the different study designs. And people often overstretch. You know, they've done an observational study and they come up with a conclusion, for example, of safety and efficacy, which you cannot do. And so you have to just be aware of, of what you can and can't say on the basis of your research design. So I'm going to go through these research designs um, and just yeah, describe their utility, their, some of their benefits, their advantages or disadvantages. So much of health research can really be broken down into two basic types. You've got your observational research and your experimental research. In observational re-studies, the, the researchers just observe and gather data on some phenomenon that's already happening, but they don't intervene to change anything in the participants' lives, in their treatment. They just gather the information that's already there. For example, oops, somebody's got their mic on. For example, describing the antibiotic prescription processes in a NICU. Um, describing your patient profile, um, describing mortality, the, the incidence of mortality, um, describing what else could we describe? Um, describing, yeah, we've done antibiotic prescription practice. It, th there are a number of different things that you can describe using, using data that's already there that we're collecting every day. With experimental research, on the other hand, 
you actually intervene as a research in some way. For example, you give one group of children paracetamol and you do not give the other group paracetamol. That's fiddling with their lives, right? That's intervening, that's actively doing something. Um, and so that makes it experimental. And within each category of observational and experimental, there are other research designs. So in observational studies, which we'll start with, these are really categorized into whether or not there is a comparison group. Whilst in experimental studies, they're classified into whether the intervention was assigned randomly or not assigned randomly. And the best designs um, in experimental studies are those that assign the participants randomly to an allocation. Um, those who get the treatment, those who get an alternative treatment or don't get the treatment. So I'm going to start with observational studies. I think these, this, these are the studies, as I said, that you will be using. Um, but we're also going to talk about experimental studies because that's where the higher levels of evidence are. And that's you have to obviously interrogate those in your literature, literature reviews as well. So all observational studies we have to recognize from the outset have significant bias. In fact, most studies have some bias, but obs all observational studies will have fairly significant bias. And what bias means really is a deviation from truth. So there may be different causes of bias and there's a whole range of them, which I'm not going to go into, but selection bias is a big one. How are you choosing your population? Um, if you're randomly assigning children, that selection bias is reduced. If you include everyone in a population, you minimize your selection bias as well. The way that you measure, the way that you obtain your information is open to bias. If you are retrospectively documenting data that's been recorded in the folder, think about your information bias or your measurement bias there. So the way one registrar is going to be documenting um, patient um, examination might be different from another registrar. And some information may be there always for this one, but not available for the other or if they may be measuring something differently or reporting it differently. Confounding is relates to when something impacts on the outcome that is not related to the treatment or the intervention that you are interested in. There's something else that affects it. Um, and that we need to consider. And performance bias as well, how you actually do the research. So we'll start at the bottom of the triangle um, of descriptive studies looking at case reports and case series. I can't help you with that on Mac. I love when, when Siri arrives and starts talking to me. Sorry, I must make Siri go away. Siri, go away. Can't make okay. Siri go away. <laughs> All right, I made Siri go away. Sorry about that. Um, so case reports are the least publishable unit in medical literature. It's a single observation that might prompt further investigation, um, it's really you find something interesting that you maybe haven't seen before, and there may be some very early signals that whatever you've done has made a different difference. It's also useful sometimes for recognizing new or very rare conditions, but most medical journals will not publish case reports because of their very low level of evidence, because they are completely unrepresentative of a broader population. But we also do recognize that in some cases, case reports are important or are useful. What's more useful from the case single case report is the case series, where we take multiple individual cases and we present them in one report. And this is useful because it can generate hypotheses for further research. But again, it's not generalizable. We often use retrospective data because you only start picking up on patterns after you've seen two or three or four children with the similar condition. And again, there's no control group, so we can't compare this to anything usually with a case series. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I can't make, how do I make Siri go away altogether? Siri, turn off. I didn't get that. Could you try again? How do I make Siri go away altogether? I'm sorry about that. Um, so if we, if we look at this picture, you can see the inherent bias with a case report or case series. I want you to look at this picture and see what, what do you see? Any questions? Ah, I've gone away altogether because Siri's gone away altogether. Sorry. From the panel, 
What do people see when they look at this picture? So I see a, a lady with a feather. Um, okay. A hat with a head see? turned away, Anybody earring see? towards me, sort of a feather bow around her neck. Anybody else see anything different? Ah, we've got an old lady over there. Can people see the old lady if they look for her? So you can see the lady with her eye and you can see the old lady. That's the, la the young lady's chin becomes the old lady's nose. So this is really showing you the fundamental problems or biases with case reports, because we might see something that we think is absolutely true and clearly a result of the treatment that we did. It made a difference. It's worth presenting to the world. Somebody else may look at that case and say, wait a minute, I don't see that. Um, I've done that with a whole lot of patients. It, it hasn't made a difference. Or, or actually, you've done something else that's interesting here, but the treatment that you're talking about is not the interesting thing. And that's the problem is that we come at things from, from a different perspective, which produces bias. So those of you who can see both of them straight away, that's a really useful aspect because it means that you are less biased. You, you're able to see things from different angles. It's just quite a fun picture. So when we look at descriptive studies, they do have advantages. Um, in that the data are already there, they're available, so you can just document them. They're cheap, so you can do them quite, quite easily. They're not very many ethical difficulties, as long as you have permission to use the information from the Papier perspective. Very useful for very rare conditions, because you can collect some information about a rare condition that you are seeing in your practice. And they can be powerful advocacy tools. Um, and I'll come to an example with that. The disadvantages are the temporal associations are really not clear at all. In other words, the timelines um, and cause and effect and associ associations, you can't make any conclusions about it. Again, we don't have a control group. You've just got this one group that's interesting. Um, and as I said, there's huge built-in bias with some people seeing the young lady and some people seeing that old lady. So the, these are really considered the weakest kind of observational studies. But as I said, they can be helpful for rare diseases and powerful for advocacy. And the most well-known historical case reports or case series um, related to the thalidomide issues, where a doctor noticed only two newborn babies had absent limbs. They were born with phocomelia. And um, I didn't get that. Could okay. you try again? Just hold on one second while I'm going to pause myself for a moment. Siri, off all Siri only comes on when I'm giving presentations. It must be the way that I talk. So this was the case, a case series of two children. Um, and a pediatrician had noticed these two newborn babies being born with phocomelia, with absent limbs. And they, this, this pediatrician um, went back into the mother's history and realized that they'd both taken this new drug, this thalidomide, um, in early pregnancy. And he very, very quickly put together a case report, that was McBride, to alert colleagues to the possibility of drug-related harm. And he, he put this out as a report as quickly as possible. There was no causation known. They didn't know that thalidomide caused this problem. But he went, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Um, let's, let's just put it out to the world just in case. And obviously from there, there was a clear association made that thalidomide was associated with congenital abnormalities. And the drug was then withheld for pregnancy. And I think this is just one, it, it really highlights the fact that it can be really useful. It can be really important for highlighting something that's worthy of further study. The other part of observational studies is the analytical studies, um, where there is a comparison group. And we then divide these according to the direction of study. So cohort studies, which are going forward, case control studies, which are looking backwards, and cross-sectional studies, which are sort of a snapshot in time. So the cross-sectional studies are really what's happening now. Um, usually these are prevalence type studies. Um, so the one we're doing at the moment is what is the prevalence of pediatric acute respiratory distress syndrome in children admitted to PICUs across South Africa? That's a study that we're currently doing. That's a cross-sectional prevalence study that's describing the health of populations. And really, we're actually 
recording the outcome and exposure at the same time. So you take a snapshot, you see how many of them have the health condition, um, and you can then see, you know, are there any um, factors that are associated with the outcome that you're measuring? But it's all done in the here and now. So you'll, for example, say I'm just choosing this day to, to see what the prevalence is, or I'm choosing this week to see what the point prevalence is. When we look at case control studies, this is really thinking backwards. You have children with an outcome and you look back to see if they had a common exposure. So you start with your group of interest and then you find a comparison group. And so people will often do a matched comparison. It'll be children, for example, of the same age, the same weight, but without the condition of interest, for example, will be your comparison group. You then look back at their histories, and that can just be with your notes, your medical notes, and you compare the histories. And you, you think about whether or not they both experienced the same exposures, or maybe your group of interest has had a higher um, incidence of one exposure. Um, so for example, again, with the, with the PARD study that we're doing at the moment, you could, you, you could do this in a different way. You could take a group of children who have PARD, who develop PARDs, and you look back and see what are their risk factors for it. Um, how many, for example, um, had invasive mechanical ventilation is an obvious one. Um, how many had sepsis? There might be other conditions that we're interested in. Perhaps um, having neonatal morbidities predisposes to developing PARDs with critical illness later. I'm not sure. So there are different ways of doing it. But effectively, you've got a group that you look at now, and you take the history and you draw conclusions. So case control studies are very efficient in terms of time, money, and effort because you have your patients right there. They're quick to conduct. You don't need a huge number of participants or patients, and you can use existing records. Um, you can look at multiple risk factors or exposures at the same time. And this is very useful if your outcome is rare because you already have the patients. And actually, if you did a prospective study, it would take you a very, very long time to follow up a lot of different patients to get only one with the outcome, for example. So prospective would just really take too long. Um, so these are really useful in, in, study, in, in diseases that are rare and diseases with, that take a very long time to develop as well. The disadvantage is that you're collecting information that's already been collected and sometimes a long time ago. It's especially problematic if you're interviewing parents, for example, to get information because recall bias is a very big problem. People remember specific things, they forget other stuff that they may not see as being relevant, for example. Um, there's particularly survivor bias in that often you'll only be looking at the patients that are still alive. Um, and then comparing them. And so you'll have lost patients along the line that haven't survived or that have, have, have fallen out for other reasons. It can sometimes be quite challenging to select your control group with these patients. Um, obviously you can't determine the rate of disease. You have yourself a pre-selected group. So you're, there's quite a lot of selection bias here. And if your exposure rate is low, it's not always very efficient. The cohort studies are looking forward in time. It assembles a group of patients and it follows them over time. So although the direction is forward though, you can also have retrospective studies that are cohort studies. So time moves forward, but they can be done prospectively or retrospectively. So if I ask the question, what are the developmental outcomes of infants admitted to the PICU? You can see I can do a prospective cohort study where I can take a group of children who are in ICU now, and I can follow them up at one month, three months, six months, three years after ICU discharge, for example, or I can go and get a group of patients, or I can retrospectively choose patients that have already been in the ICU, um, who now come to develop mental clinic, for example, and I can go backwards and follow, still following them up, but it's, it's a different way of doing things. The best cohort study designs are prospective, where you literally do take people and you follow them through. Um, usually it's people, it's, it's your population without your outcome that you follow, you see what the exposures are, and then you look at the outcomes at the end. So many of you will have heard of the Drakenstein study, that's a large prospective birth cohort study, where they're taking a large population of children that are from birth, and they're following them through to school age, 
to look at, amongst other things, development of respiratory disease. And then they can look at a huge number of exposures within that and risk factors. So cohort studies give a much better idea of causality. And actually, in some, some people have argued that these can be quite similar to um, control st studies, um, prospective experimental studies. Um, because they're prospective, you can actually look at incidents. Um, you can look at the natural history of the disorder. In other words, you can get that temporal association moving forward. Um, they're good for investigating rare exposures. There's a reduced risk of survivor bias with the prospective studies because you, you are actually following people up. Um, and so you can keep reminding them really, and you can keep track of where your patients are. If um, the cohort is a prospective cohort, you can look at in things like incidence rates, relative risks. You can really calculate your confidence intervals um, and you can get some quite robust data here, which is, which is quite exciting. The disadvantages are that if your exposure or your risk factors are rare, you need very large numbers of patients to, to look at your outcomes. And there's still selection bias here. Um, if you're doing a retrospective um, cohort study, again, there's a potential for information bias, and you don't have control over your data collection methods. So in terms of standardization, if you're doing retrospectively, which is problematic. Prospectively, we can really tighten that up so we can be very standardized. For the prospect of long-term cohorts, loss to follow-up is a problem. Um, it can be extremely expensive and it takes a very lot of time. So those are your, your disadvantages. If we look at observational studies as a whole, there are a number of limitations that we see. So generally we can only look at association between a risk factor and an outcome. You can't attribute causation usually. Um, and I think that's really important because people, people get overexcited and they overstretch their results and their conclusions and say one thing causes another. Or um, So if, if you're just describing, I'll, I'll come back and I'm sorry I'm using that example, but the paracetamol use with PDA, is it safe and effective? Well, if you're just describing use, you can't say it's safe if you're not really comparing it to something else. You can't say it's effective if, you, if you're not comparing it to something that's been done in a standardized way. Um, we need to consider our confounders and all observational studies will have confounders. Those are those difficult to predict variables, again, which are associated with both the cause and the potential effect that you're, you are interested in. There is some fancy footwork which allows you to sometimes estimate causal effects. It's an estimation um, and this is beyond my pay grade. I can do the multiple regressions, but the propensity score analyses and sensitivity analyses are, are quite challenging to perform. Um, but some statisticians actually say that certainly with a prospective well-controlled cohort study, you can do these things, but generally speaking, you can't. Um, and then there's big data registries with very, very large sample sizes where you can have a better estimation of causality, even if you cannot really confirm causality. Hope I'm making some sense. Please do put up your hand if I'm not making sense. This is just giving you some idea of, of, of the problem of attributing causality versus association. So we look at a one that it, largely in adults, let's look at the association between having yellow fingers and lung cancer. So what could the causality be here? Um, well, yellow fingers might cause lung cancer, right? Yeah, everybody that you've seen with lung cancer has yellow fingers. So clearly that's causing the lung cancer. Or somebody else might say, uh, no, the lung cancer is causing the yellow fingers. It's a reverse causation. But then you also notice that everybody's smoking and there's your confounder. So smoking causes both yellow fingers and lung cancer. But what happens if there's something else, another variable that is completely different that both yellow fingers and lung cancer is causing? That's a collider bias as well. That's quite a fun word, collider bias uh, variable. It may, it may have nothing to do with the smoking. It may be, and it may have nothing to do with yellow fingers and cancer. It's something completely different. So there are all these possibilities when you're doing research and as I said, we, we tend to be biased in that if we see the result that we want to see, we make a conclusion we want to make. And it's not always the correct conclusion. 
you also have to come at problems from different angles or methodologies in order to verify your results. And that's where, where again, this evidence-based practice, which is a collection of knowledge, comes into play. You can't just do the same experiment over and over again because it, you, know, you just basically can do the same thing again and again. You have to verify your results using different types of techniques. And this is a, a, something we call triangulation. Um, every different study has its own biases, but when you put them all together, even a group of disparate observational studies can give you fairly strong evidence to support an hypothesis or an effect. Because if, you, if you're always getting the similar results from different angles, it's, it's suggesting a, a stronger association. So we've gone from observational studies to now we're looking at the experimental studies. And we have two options here. They can either be randomized controlled trials or non-randomized controlled trials. Your non-randomized controlled trials are quite similar to a cohort study, except that you are assigning the intervention. You are manipulating something, whereas the cohort is just observing. Um, there's obviously a risk of selection bias here because who's getting the intervention, who's not getting the intervention? How are you choosing your patients? What's usually presented as your gold standard is your randomized control trial, um, which is really the only way to avoid selection and confounding biases if they're done properly and they're not always done properly. So here we use complete chance like throwing a dice to assign your control, your case groups. These should have internal validity, but they may not always have external validity. In other words, they, they, they usually are true in relation to the population being studied, but they might not be applicable to a different group. So a study, a, a good randomized control trial done in um, Australia is highly relevant to the Australian population potentially, but it might not be relevant or valid for our population, which is very different. There are also often ethical issues with randomized controlled trials because you're giving one group something that you're not giving the other. So that has to be carefully thought of. So we talk about the gold standard, but the randomized controlled trial is not the best study designed for every research question. Um, so at least what it does is it determines that the potential confounders are equally distributed between the groups. Um, and the only difference between the groups is supposed to be the intervention. And that really allows researchers to tease out what effect that intervention has. So that's why the conclusions from these experiments are considered to be the most reliable and the most trustworthy. And you can ascertain cause and effect relationships if you've got a well-conducted trial. But you do still have to interrogate how things were done. Was there appropriate blinding, for example? Um, what was the comparator? Was it single blinded, double blinded? I'm not going to go into all of those aspects, but you, you do need to think quite carefully about that. And then at the top of your evidence-based triangle are your systematic reviews or meta-analyses. So these, these reviews address that problem of the single studies puzzle piece. Rather than relying on just one person's experience or even just one randomized controlled trial, synthesized evidence draws on multiple sources. It weighs the contribution of each of those studies to arrive at a much better supported conclusion um, according to each of the studies, the, the rigors, the included studies rigor, the relevance of those studies. So really, this is the highest form of evidence. This is the king of evidence. Um, and it's actually, it should be the best science to inform decision making. But again, systematic reviews can be done badly. They can be biased in systematic reviews. So you also have to read those quite critically. But the idea is that if you take a lot of different studies done on thousands of people and taken together as a whole, we can get closer to the truth than any single study or anecdote ever could. Um, so these are should be less biased um, than a selective sampling of smaller studies because it's done in a very systematic, clear way with good methodology. Um, and if the results of the studies are sufficiently similarly collected and reported, you can put them together as one big analysis as well. Um, so the results are then combined and entered as if it were one big study. 
which is really useful. But these are not easy to do. Um, I think you should all be familiar with the Cochrane reviews. So I've done I've done two of two of them now, and I've I've reviewed quite a few. It is a real pain. They are really really difficult to do. They are really really rigorous. But it was also easy to do something that you call a systematic review that's done with less rigor. Um, and actually the results are sometimes a little bit dodgy. I've seen two systematic reviews on the identical topic that have arrived, arrived at different conclusions, which makes it really different, difficult from a practice perspective to work out exactly what we should be doing. So you are sitting here at an MMED level and most of you will be choosing an observational design. So why do we bother? Why are we doing it? Well, the first thing is that experimental studies are often just too expensive. They may have ethical issues. They're not feasible. They usually take a long time. They're really challenging to do. So that's the first issue. But observational designs as well are useful. Um, some of them can actually give fairly definitive answers like a prospective cohort studies, but others are really important to build hypotheses for future experimental studies. There is value in that, is value in building hypotheses, in describing interesting phenomena that haven't been described before. They sometimes do give answers, but they really are very useful building blocks to the next step. That's your RCTs, your experimental studies, your development of clinical guidelines. Um, decision making on an individual patient basis and on policy development. So they are useful, they are worth doing, they do give useful information. Again, you just have to be realistic in what you can and cannot conclude from them. And there are ways of strengthening your reporting of observational studies so that you can give um, good reports and good conclusions at the end of it. Strobe is just one of them. And this gives you detailed checklists for what you need to conclude, sorry, include when you're writing up your observational studies. And actually, I use this in writing up my proposals as well to make sure that I've considered all the aspects that I need to report on at the end. And a strobe statement or a similar um, statement is actually required by many journals before they'll consider publication. Many of these are actually methodological considerations. So you can't suddenly decide on them after the study's been, been finished. You actually need to consider all of these elements when you're developing your study protocol. So I think that's quite important. So just very briefly before a comfort break, let's go back to some of the questions um, that we, we, we looked at. And I'm gonna choose some of your questions, I think. Um, and we'll look at the research designs that we could use. So, the impact of socioeconomic status on development of asthma. Well, this could be a systematic review. You can put a whole lot of research that's already been done together. It could be even a systematic scoping review. It could be a case control study. Let's take a group of children with asthma and let's go back and see what their socioeconomic status is. Um, there are actually a number of different possibilities here. Uh, the next one, Long-term functional outcomes, this could be a prospective cohort study, again, a systematic review, a retrospective case control study. If we go back to um, the, what are the pathogens causing bloodstream infections in neonates in the NICU and their antibiotics sensitivities, this could be a purely descriptive retrospective study, um, literally taking a cohort of patients that have been admitted to the NICU and pulling out their, their pathology, their microbiology reports. Um, if the question is, what is the safety and efficacy of paracetamol in the treatment of symptomatic PDA in preterm babies? The best thing there would be a randomized control trial, a randomized double blind placebo control trial, perhaps. Um, if we are simply describing the use of paracetamol or associated outcomes, um, we could do, for example, a case control, retrospective case control study. Are we starting on a new topic? Okay, but can you see, depending on the question that's asked, um, you can actually address it in lots of different ways. Prevalence of delirium in infants less than two years of age, that's a cross-sectional study, right? Cross-sectional observational study, point prevalence study. This question of children um, receiving an immune modulator with CF, best thing would be a randomized controlled trial. We could also do a prospective cohort study where we are just following children up 
if we're lucky enough to get the modulators here, let's see what happens to children, the natural history of the disease, who receive it or who do not receive it, for example. I'm hoping you get the idea that you can come at things from very, very different angles. Uh, Mpefu, do you want to, can you speak? Oh, it's okay. We'll come back to that, that's fine. Um, Brenda, I do see Kelly Wong has her hand up, so I'm gonna allow oh, her to cool. talk. Great. Um, Kelly, go ahead, I see your hand is up. Is it working? Um, I think you must just unmute yourself. So I have given her permission to talk okay. and I'm going to, I see another hand up. So I'm going to give both people with their hands up permission to talk. Great. Sorry, I'm also a bit slow with this guy. So you must bear with me. So Kelly, I've allowed you to speak and I'm asking you to unmute. And in PEFO, I've also allowed you to talk. So both of you have speaking rights if you'd like to unmute. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> I was struggling to type and ended up sending something before I could even talk. It's fine. Um, therefore, I'm, yeah, I am in the Eastern Cape. Anyways, I had a research topic that I struggled with a bit. So I've actually changed completely from that. So I am looking at something new. So what I'm looking at in our setting is CT scan indications and yields like in the medical patients to see like it's basically going through the data from uh, 2021 to see how many CT scans did we do and what were the indications and what was the yield for that. Um, yeah, my challenge uh, so far is with the, I've seen a study from Red Cross, which looks at more or less the same thing. Uh, but the reports had to go via the radiologists, which is a bit of a challenge here in the Eastern Cape, like to have like an actual radiologist uh, reporting on the CT scan. So I don't know if it's, it would make sense to the ones that we've seen and didn't change any clinical uh, in terms of like interventions and all that, would that still be sufficient, even if it wasn't like a formal radiologist kind of uh, reporting on those CT scans, like basically the ones that we didn't think there was anything wrong. Yeah, so, so it depends what you're trying to show. So I mean, if you're trying to advocate for the, that, that you need radiologists in your institution, it would be really useful to, to get a group of expert radiologists to actually review those, those report, the, the, um, the, the scans. And, and so you can see, you know, what did you miss? in not having a radiologist. So that's, that's one way of looking at it. If you are just describing what happens in your institution without radiology um, consultation, that's a different question. And that could be purely descriptive. The problem okay. there is you're missing out a chunk, but, but you know, you could, you could say that, you know, of, you know, 50% actually, we didn't, we yielded no useful information to change practice, but in the other 50% it did. And then you can, you can try and get an idea of, of whether it's worth doing in terms of expense as well. Um, okay. The other hand, as I say, the ones where you didn't pick anything up, was there actually something there that you missed? So it, okay. it's, it depends on the question that you're asking. And if you're just describing practice, but if you want to use it as an advocacy tool, you might want to take it one step further. Okay. So okay. Sense. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Somebody else. Um, hand? Thank you. Um, I think Kelly's put her hand down, but I see there's another um, question in the chat. Um, let's see who's out there. Muko, I'm going to see if I can unmute you. Sometimes it's easier if you. Um, present your own question directly. Um, okay, so I've given you permission to talk. Um, Makove, Hello, if you want to morning, speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask if you can advise on the different study methods that I can use regarding this topic. Sure. And what would be the pros and cons of each method? So we're looking at immunological and virological outcomes of children living with HIV, right? That started ARVs yes. very early on. Um, so in terms of those outcomes, what specifically are you looking at? So we're looking at the mortality. Yeah. 
Um, we're looking uh -huh. at the the word mm. compliance. Okay, so, so that's, that's the and the compliance is, is not an outcome. So your outcome is, is so mortality is one of them. So immunologic and biologic is different. So if you're looking at mortality, um, it's 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 you, you'd rather go go forwards from children who are start, starting on ARV. So then you take a cohort of children that start ARVs early and you follow them up for mortality outcomes. And that could be retrospectively done as well. So you 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 go back to um, I don't know 2020 and you get a collection of folder numbers of every child that was started on ARVs in the first two weeks of life. And then you're sitting at in 2022 and you say, what are the two year, what's the two year mortality of those children, for example? Um, so that could be a cohort study, either done prospectively or retrospectively. On the other hand, if you're looking at some specific immunological outcome, you could look at um, your infectious diseases clinic population now, and you see which children have a specific immunological outcome that you're interested in, which don't, and you look back um, and see what impact that, you know, how many of them started ARVs early and how many started later, for example. If you're trying to see whether early versus late ARV initiation makes a difference on those outcomes. So there's, 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 again, there's different ways of doing it depending on the nuance and what is the primary and secondary outcome that you're looking at. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you. So much. You sure? Okay. okay. I just wanted to give people a two minute um, comfort break because otherwise I think it gets quite long before we go on to the analytical um, aspects. Is that okay, Sereni? Um, that's completely fine. My time says 9.27. So if people are happy, can we do a three minute stretch and walk and maybe we can start at 9.30? Does that sound reasonable? Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We'll see you all in three minutes. I'm not logging off, so please just leave your computers on for everyone's, um, uh, for simplicity's sake, and we'll see you in three minutes. Thanks.
Let me know when I need to start again, Serene. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I think Brenda, you look like you're very ready to go. So shall we <laughs> you in the next session? Sure. Um, I'm trying to keep to time, but it's you know, it's 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 quite challenging, but that's fine. I think we I think we're on track, so that's good. Is everybody back in the room, the virtual room? We seem to have 67 people and they seem to still be here in one way or another. Okay, so moving on to some of the analytical considerations, and I know this is, is a challenging area. So this is very, very brief. Um, uh, so this is a, a stats 101 overview, but you have to consider the analytical methods and framework when you're developing your protocols. You can't just leave it, and you can't just say that you're going to get a statistician to do it. You actually need to really understand what you're going to collect, why are you collecting it, and what you're going to do with the data. And that needs to be done early on in the process. So some of you may have heard this, um, there are three kinds of lies, um, lies, damned lies, and statistics. And it is true that you can manipulate your data to, largely to show something you want to show, which is why we need to be suspicious of what we read, especially what you read in, in um, social media when people are trying to interpret clinical trials results. They do it in ways that make it appear very um, enticing or very persuasive, where in fact the stats aren't actually showing what, what they're reporting or in the same way they're reporting. So you do need to be aware of, of what you're doing and why are you doing it? So people think of statistics as something that's really, really complex, but really all it is is a way to get usable information from your raw data. So we have our different stages. Um, you've done your protocol, you're going to collect your data, so you need to know what you're going to be collecting. You must prepare your data and organize your data in a, in a, a usable way. Um, for me, with Emed specifically, one of the big things to get right in the protocol stage already, before you even submit your protocol for review, is to get your spreadsheet, your database um, set up in a way that you can actually collect data that you are able to analyze at the end. You want to make sure that the data is organized in a way that you can use so that your, cat your coding is done appropriately, your continuous variables are all collected in the same way, your dates are there as dates in your Excel sheet so that you can actually use them and manipulate them to work out age, for example. It's simple things, but they're really, really important to get organized so you can do something with them. So you collect your data, you organize your data in some way, and then you are going to be analyzing your data descriptively to start with, which is, we got to come to what that is, just, it's really just saying what you have found. Um, and then moving forward to more deeper analyses that you can actually interpret and apply to the bigger population. And from there, make sure that the conclusions you've made are appropriate to the data and the study type that you have done. This is an important one. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. The studies, as, as an editor that I'm most suspicious of um, when I get something to review for any of my journals is um, if they have really tried to baffle me with bullshit, if they've used the statistical methods in quite a simple study that I've never heard of, it is usually saying to me that it's rubbish. And then I need to really look at it in a lot of detail um, to work out what they've done and why they've done it. If a study is simple, if it's an observational study, it usually doesn't require very fancy footwork in terms of statistics. So as I said, think about your data. It's really, really important to consider the type of data that you're going to be collecting. It needs to be appropriate to your research questions, your aims, your objectives. Maybe you're answering hypotheses. Um, and your statistical approach also must be defined at the start. You shouldn't just data fish. People love throwing their data at a stats um, program and hoping to get some red p-values at the other side. Um, that's not appropriate. You're asking a question and you need to do the analysis to answer those questions specifically. 
quite like the idea that analysis actually means loosening up. It's the opposite of synthesis, which is a putting together. So usually we, you know, we collect the data and then we analyze it, we loosen it up, we see what's happening. And at the end, you synthesize again to put it all together and make conclusions. So many of you will have pro forma protocol sheets that require you to enter your independent and dependent variables. Um, and this is often confusing for people. So in general, the independent variable is the one that you are manipulating as the researcher. Um, it's the thing that's influencing, the thing that's making the change, the cause. And you're looking at the effect on the dependent variable. Um, so that's often your outcome measures. And there may be different levels of um, independent and dependent variables as well. So for example, if you are comparing one experimental treatment with a control treatment, those are your independent variables. You've got two levels of independent variables. And then you've got, you're looking at the outcome, which is your dependent variable. Okay, so if you've got an experimental and a control group that you're comparing, you have two levels of your independent variable. And you're looking at the effect on your dependent variable, your outcome. If you're comparing five different interventions, then your independent variable has five different levels. Okay, so independent variable influences the changes in the dependent variable. Hope that makes sense. When we're looking at our outcome data, our dependent variables, there are different types of quantitative data as well. So you're looking at categorical data and you're looking at numerical data. If we are looking at um, our categorical data, so these are categories, it may be nominal and it may be ordinal. So if you're thinking of things like male and female, um, disease, yes, disease, no, that's nominal data. Okay, your sex, male or female, color of your eyes, red, well, it wouldn't be red, hopefully, um, blue, green, brown, for example. Okay, you branding it, it becomes nominal. Your ordinal data is ranked data. So for example, if you have a, um, a Likert scale where something, um, let's, see, let's say pain, your pain faces scale where naught is no pain and five is considerable pain. It's, it's ranked data, but the difference between the ranking is meaningless. So if I say that my, um, my pain is four out of five and you, and, and yesterday my pain was three out of five, that difference of one doesn't make any difference. It's not meaningful. So one is more than the other, but the difference in terms of numbers is meaningless. Hopefully that makes the same, make, make some sense to you. We then have our numerical data that can be discrete. In other words, you can count it. Those are non-binary integers, non-negative integers, sorry, um, and continuous data, which you should be looking at. So that's length, weight, um, temperature, um, SATs, PCT, heart rate. Any of those are continuous data that we're measuring, okay? We need to remember when we're looking at our data analysis that you can't do the same thing with all types of data. So with ordinal data and nominal data, we, with ordinal data, you can look at medians, you can look at percentiles, you can look at frequency distribution. You can't add them or subtract them, but you can do that with your continuous variables. That's the interval and ratio here. I haven't got into that. That's a little bit too complex, but that's all your continuous data. You can manipulate your continuous data a lot, but you need to be careful about what you do with your nominal and your ordinal data. So what some people do is they'll say that there's a pain scale. They'll say this um, medication is highly effective in reducing pain because it reduced the pain scale by two points. Um, that might not be an appropriate conclusion because that two points is not terribly meaningful. And if we compare that two points to another intervention that reduced it by, by four points, that difference between them is not necessarily meaningful. Don't see any hands up. So I'm hoping I'm making sense. The other thing you must plan to do from the start is to test your data for normality. Um, a lot of people just presume that their data has this nice bell-shaped curve, 
but most of the data that you, 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 you guys will be collecting will not be normally distributed. Usually the sample sizes are relatively small in the types of research that are done by registrars, and it's usually not normally distributed. So you do need to test that there are different tests you can use. I like the Shapiro Wilkes W test. There's also a Criscoll Wallace and Lillifors test. They are widely available. They're very easy to use, but they tell you whether your data is normally distributed or not. In other words, whether it's parametric or non-parametric. Make sure that you are using your appropriate analytical methods. Think about whether you are just doing look, reporting descriptive statistics or whether you are, are conducting inferential statistics as well. Your descriptive statistics are just that, they're describing. They don't generalize beyond the data at hand. They just give you simple summaries about your specific research sample. They don't try and say and extend that to the larger population. And together with your graphs and your tables, they form the basis of virtually every quantitative data analysis. Most papers will first give your descriptive statistics. We included 500 participants. Median age was three months range, one month to nine months, for example. That's your, those are descriptive statistics. Your inferential statistics are when you actually start looking at hypothesis testing. You're trying to make conclusions related to the bigger population. You're trying to determine relationships, make predictions. So it's much more in depth. The areas of interest for descriptive statistics are really largely measures of central tendency and counting. So I had X many um, patients this number or the percentage of them had, the, had this condition, for example. And as I said, we're looking at central tendency. So depending on whether it's normally distributed or not normally distributed, you might report mean age for normally distributed data. For non-parametric data, you would report the median age, for example, with your quartiles. You're also looking at your measures of dispersion or variation around the central tendency. So for normally distributed data, we'll talk about the standard deviation. For non-normal data, we'll talk about the range or the interquartile range. And then you've got your inferential statistics. And all of us doing research, we really want this. We want the significant results. That's what we're excited about. But actually there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. And the p-value is not the be all and end all of research. The point of the inferential statistics here is that we are trying to generalize our result from the sample to the bigger population. And so you have to be aware of your sample size limitation when you are trying to do your inferential statistics and making conclusions. You just need to be aware of that. So there are obviously different types of data that we can look at in different ways inferentially. So you might, for example, be looking at a diagnostic test. Um, and then you're wanting to see how good is this test at, at accurately diagnosing or accurately screening for the problem. And that re refers to the, the test's discriminative ability. So you've heard of sensitivity and specificity, and that relates to discrimination. Um, so you want to know what is the true positive rate? What is the false positive rate? What is the false negative rate and the true negative rate? And from there, we can determine our sensitivity and we can determine our specificity as well. And they are very specific um, calculations that we can, we can determine. They're quite easy to do. Um, if you look at people who really have the disease or condition and those that do not have the condition, and then you can look at whether the test shows you have it or the test does not show that you have it. And we can then calculate sensitivity and specificity. I can send you these slides if it's useful for you. Sensitivity and specificity are also determined by the receiver operating curves. And this helps you to show the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity for any possible cutoff for a test, for a continuous um, test or a combination of tests. And if you're reading um, studies on diagnostic tests, they will talk about the area under the curve, the area under the, the receiver operating curve or the rock curve, gives you an idea about the general usefulness of the test. The greater the area under the curve, the more useful the test is. A perfect test would have an area under the curve of one. A worthless test would have an area under the curve of less than 0.5. So this is the area under the curve here. 
and you're looking at your sensitivity along this axis, along the, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, along the Y axis, axis and the specificity along the X axis. And your curve is this blue line. The closer it is to the left upper corner, the better the sensitivity and specificity. And you're obviously wanting a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity, depending on whether you're doing a diagnostic test or a screening test as well. So this can give us different cutoffs for what the best test, the best cutoff is for your um, diagnostic test, or you can evaluate a cutoff um, in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So again, this is looking at your diagnostic accuracy, look interpreting your area under the curve. If it's between 0.9 to one, that's excellent. If it's less than 0.5, as I said, it's, it's not useful. And then there's a range in between as to how useful your test is. So the greater the area, the more useful is the test. The other thing we may be looking at with inferential testing is hypothesis testing. So you've got a null hypothesis, your H0, and you've got your hypothesis, H1. And really what you're trying to do is disprove the null hypothesis in order to prove your hypothesis. So your null hypothesis is the status quo. It's already accepted, but you need to try and reject it to prove that the alternative thing is true. That's your null hypothesis. So let me give you a highly relevant um, example of a research study that's relevant to my household, having just done sock washing. I'd like to know where all my socks have gone because I've only got single socks of about 10 pairs. So the null hypothesis is that there's some weird explanation for the disappearing socks. They're ending up in the back of my washing machine. Um, the dog is eating them. That's my null hypothesis. That's the status quo. If that's not the case, well, my alternate hypothesis is that extraterrestrial being, beings have arrived in my house and they are stealing my socks. That's my alternate hypothesis. So the point of my study now is to disprove any other possible explanation in order to prove that actually these aliens are coming in and stealing my socks. I do blame it on the fairies, actually, not the aliens. Um, that is an example of your of the hypothesis that I'm trying to prove. I see something in the chat. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, this, it's a very meaningful research example in my world, and I haven't yet managed to prove it, but I'm getting there. You also have to be aware that mistakes can be made because this is just looking at chance. And so you can come up with a, with a result that is significant and it still is not correct. So you might accept your null hypothesis and it might be true. On the other hand, you might actually be making a mistake. You might be seeing a difference and there's actually no difference. That's a type one error. So you've come up with a significant value, but actually there's no real difference between two things that you're interested in. On the other hand, you might not see a difference when there really is one. That usually happens when your sample size is too small and that's a type two error where there actually, there actually really is a difference and you just haven't picked it up statistically because your sample size is too small. So when you're looking at your limitations in your discussion, consider whether there's a chance of your having made either a type one or a type two error. Okay, and as many of us seem to worship the, the great p-value. Um, so we do need to talk about that. A p-value isn't a magical number. It just tells you the likelihood that the results that you are seeing, whether they were due to chance, whether they were likely due to chance or not. So a p-value of less than 0.05, that magical number, just tells you that, that your result would have arisen by chance on fewer than one occasion out of 20. It's a fairly arbitrary cutoff that's been chosen, um, but that's what it is. That's the one that's been chosen generally as being significant versus non-significant. If you have a p-value of less than 0.01, you have 100 to one odds that it would have occurred by chance. It still could have occurred by chance because that's playing the gambling game. So a p-value, as I said, only tells us the likelihood of whether your results are real or by chance alone. It's not an absolute, yeah, it, it's, not, it's not giving us really, really convincing results. But obviously, the lower your p-value, the less likely it was by chance. So if your p-value is less than 0.001, you've got less than one in a thousand chance of being wrong. It's still there, but it's much, much lower. 
So by the laws of chance, if it's p-value less than 0.05, one in 20 times you will get significant results even if there's no real relationship or association. And this is one of the reasons as well why you should also think about adjusting for multiple outcomes. Um, in most observational research, we have these long tables, and I, I do them as well, where you're comparing two groups with p-values, and you have like 50 things going down this table with p-values, and then you get excited because three of them come out significant. Well, if there's one in 20 chance of being wrong, if you're throwing 50 analyses at it, I expect them, I expect there to be several of them coming out as significant purely by chance. And that's why we actually should be doing Bonferroni adjustments for multiple outcomes. Um, and statisticians can advise, or you just Google it. It's really easy to do a Bonferroni adjustment. Essentially, you just change your cutoff p-value for multiple comparisons so that it has to be lower in order for you to be more likely to believe it. Um, okay, I'm going to come back to that question. Kanya is asking if a limitation can also be a bias. Oh, I'll me speak to that now. So limitations, biases are limitations of the study. Um, so yes, some of the limitations of the study can also lead to bias. It's the two are interrelated. Um, but you usually when we're talking about study limitations, we include bias as one of those limitations and sources of bias as limitations. Kanya? Does that, is that, does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. And the cutoff of 0.05, as I said, is a fairly arbitrary cutoff. Is there any real difference between a p-value of 0.06 and a p-value of 0.04 in terms of what it actually means by chance? It really isn't. There really isn't much difference. So. Again, just be, be sensitive to your results and what they really are meaning. Um, and I know some reviewers will say, well, you can't say it's, 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 it's interesting if it's 0 0.06, there's no significant difference. But actually you can say there's a signal there, there's something going on there, even if it hasn't reached your a priori distinction for, for significance. Most journals now though are asking you to present confidence intervals in addition to p-values. Um, because this really combines the statistical stuff and the clinical stuff to give an idea of how precise your result is. In other words, how strong or weak the evidence is. If you have enough numbers, you will get a significant p-value, but it doesn't actually tell you much that's useful for clinical practice. Whereas the confidence intervals tells you how close the result is. Um, so really what the 95% confidence interval is, is telling us is that if we were to repeat the study multiple times, 95% of those studies would have results within that specific range. The wider the confidence interval, the less precise are your results. The closer the confidence interval, the more precise. And if your confidence interval overlaps zero, then you can say there's no difference, it's not significant. I'm not going to um, labor this, but some people also look at effect sizes, um, which is a different way of looking at things. It's a calculated standard difference between groups. Usually it's taken with normally distributed data with looking at the mean of the one group versus the mean of the other divided by the standard deviation. And that gives a Cohen's D um, effect size, which can be small to large. And it's sometimes useful in giving an idea of how big the effect is. Usually the confidence interval will be will be appropriate and more useful than this, though. Although I have used it in some studies before. I actually used the effect size when I, I was doing a randomized controlled trial and I wasn't actually able to achieve my required sample size. And so getting an effect size get, gave, a, gave an indication of a signal of an effect, even if I couldn't um, completely conclude that there was an effect of the treatment. So when we're looking about what test to choose, you need to ask, first of all, what am I trying to show? What's the purpose of the analysis? Am I trying to um, test a difference between two groups? Am I trying to test an association or a relationship between two groups? What is the sort of data that I'm trying to, to test? What is my measurement? Am I looking at continuous data? Am I looking at categorical data? How many sets of data do I have? Am I looking at two separate groups? Am I looking at one group that before and after an intervention, for example? And is my data normal or not normal? So I'm belaboring this a bit, but it's one of the things people really are bad at. People do not test for normality and they don't report the testing for normality. Parametric tests are more powerful than non-parametric tests. 
um, but they really should only be used when it's appropriate. You can get the wrong result. You can, if you throw non-normal data at parametric tests, you can get excited, get significant results that are not true. You can only do it when appropriate. Unfortunately, this happened in my PhD. When I first threw the data, I was so excited because things were significantly different. And then I realized that actually I was using the wrong tests and, and I lost significance, which was sad, but was real. And I could actually report um, a negative um, effect. Um, so non-parametric tests are, are looking at different things. They use rank order of values. They ignore the absolute difference between them because we do not assume a straight line relationship between variables in a non-parametric test. It is more difficult to show statistical significance with non-parametric tests. And this really does lead us to, to try and, and what, to want to use parametric tests with non-normal data. You can sometimes transform skewed or non-normal data to a normal curve using log um, changes, but it's not always possible. But if you take a non-parametric um, sample set and you use tests based on normal distribution, you will get misleading results and it's not good science. So I will, I will send you, I will try and send these, these slides around so that you have a list, but they are equivalent non-parametric tests to your standard parametric tests. So for example, um, if you have, are comparing two groups of people drawn from the same population, uh, one, what shall we say? So one with one who happened to receive paracetamol and one who didn't, for example, and we wanting to compare a continuous outcome. If you've got normally distributed continuous outcomes, you will do an unpaired or independent t-test. If it's non-normal data, you will use a man whitney u test to compare those two independent samples. Oh, I've actually got examples there. I forgot about that. On the other hand, if you are, for example, wanting to compare the weight of infants before and after a feed, um, so that's, that's a repeated measure. So one sample paired t-test will work for your parametric data. If you've got non-normal data, you'll use a Wilcoxon matched pair set. Um, if you are trying to determine a number of different time points in the same sample, for example, you're looking at plasma glucose, um, one, two, three, four hours after a meal, for example. These are, these are examples that were given to me by um, a different a, a research workshop that I did. You might use a one-way analysis of variance, repeated measures analysis of variance, or an ANOVA. Um, Non-parametric will be your Criscoll Wallace and over. If again you're now trying to say, um, okay, we're going to look at plasma glucose one hour, two hours, three hours after a meal, but now I want to compare boys and girls. I will now do a two-way and over between and within groups. Okay, and there's a non-parametric equivalent of that. Um, if we've got categorical data, you will use a chi-square test. Um, if you've got non-parametric test, you also use chi-squared, but you can use a Fisher's exact te test if you've got a very small sample size or a Yates correction, the very small sample size. And then we might want to look at the association between um, two variables. Are they going in the same direction? So let's see whether weight is correlated with height. Obvious example, I mean, they generally are, but um, you want to look at the, the strength of association between continuous variables. Is there a straight line association? So in normally distributed data, we would expect a straight line association. And then you can look at your Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient. But if it's not normal, you can't actually evaluate a straight line relationship. You will then look at the non-parametric Spearman's rank correlation, which again shows the association between the two variables, but it doesn't show it in a straight line. Okay. And then you can look at either parametric or non-parametric multiple regression analyses, which really describes the relationship between a dependent variable or an outcome and lots of different predictor variables. So that's where people will come up with a conclusion that um, this is an independent predictor of this outcome. So for example, to what did I say, to determine whether and to what extent a person's age, body fat and sodium intake might determine their blood pressure. Let's look at independent predictors of that. Um, with the PARD study we're doing at the moment, um, is age a factor? Is preterm birth a factor? Is um, the presence of sepsis a factor? Or is it more actually if they come in with direct lung injury with, with, with um, pneumonia? 
we throw all of those at a multi at a multiple regression and at the end you can come up with independent predictors which may be associated with parts at the outcome yeah, just about finished i'm hoping i've made some sense and haven't confused you even further so i want to just quickly put everything together okay so for me planning your research is really like baking a cake so everybody loves cake i love research but you have to do it well if you don't plan it you come up with a flop at the end so let's look first what do you want to bake and why so you know what you want to bake you want to bake a cupcake right that's that's your overall topic now refine it what's your actual research question so you want a cupcake but do you want a chocolate cupcake do you want a red velvet cupcake so be specific here Developing your research question, as I said at the beginning, is probably the most important thing to develop because it, it really tells you what methodological components you will have to consider moving forwards. And then look at the ingredients in the recipe. So those are like the participants in the research. Who are you including? Um, how are, and where are you getting them from? Are you recruiting them from a clinic, for example, from your ICU? Um, where are you getting the data from? Be as specific as possible. So are you getting the data from the folders? Um, are you getting it from the monitors? Are you speaking to the patient's parents to get that data? Are you in fact doing a measurement yourself to get the data? Think of your pop population and your inclusion, your exclusion criteria. Be really, really specific about who you are including and why you're including them and who you're excluding and why. If it's appropriate, if you're doing hypothesis testing, you will have to hear, do, do sample size calculations here as well. And then you want to try and get your design right. So how are you actually doing it? What, what is the, are the methods to move forward and get a good cake at the end? So get the design that can actually answer your research question with the best possible rigor, but considering what's actually feasible and doable in terms of time, resources, sample size, your own capacity. Um, identify your primary and your secondary outcome measures up front in your, in your PICO question and identify the measures that are as reliable and valid as possible in your population. Think also now about possible confounders, how you could maybe address those confounders in your analysis and in your sample moving forward. And at the end of this, you're going to have a research product. Depending on your research design and your methodology, you might have a very simple cupcake, having made some interesting observations which can generate hypotheses for further research, or perhaps you've actually designed your recipe to give the ultimate cupcake, well-powered, randomized controlled, prospective study that can determine and not just describe. But there is a place for both of these. And I'm hoping that you can recognize that now. So that's it for me. So contrary to popular belief, you can absolutely have your cake and eat it too. And I do hope that it's helped a little bit and given you some, some guidance moving forward. I'm very happy if people want to contact me directly and bounce things off me. I'd be very happy with that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. That was excellent. Um, I think you managed to actually condense my entire master's in public health into the last 90 minutes. Um, you know, I feel like I wasted a year of my life. I should have just attended this talk, but thank you very much. That was an excellent summary. Um, and I'm sure from what I can see from the comments, it looks like um, you know many, many people on this uh, workshop are uh, appreciating it too. Um, before we get to the questions, I think if possible, I just wanna add, one comment from myself as a, as a junior researcher, and um, it, it alludes to something you were saying earlier, which is the idea of um, statistical and clinical significance and how in its own way that can be so misleading. Um, and it's something you start to realize because you, you think of research as so separate to your clinical work and you think that the, the prize is that P less than 0 0.05, you know, and, and it's exactly what you're saying, you know, you can be part of a study with so many people. And I think that's what's part of it, isn't it? It's like how your study is powered. So if you've got a small study, getting to a p-value of less than 0 0.05 is actually a task in itself. So if you've got lots and lots and lots of people, you can find statistical significance far more easily, you know, and you can get that p less than 0 0.001. But what does that actually translate to in real life? Um, and, and that is also something that we learn as researchers with time. So I think, you know, if I can add something that I've just learned with time is that, you know, the, the prize in research, and that's where it's misleading, is what does this translate to in, in real life outcomes? And, and again, you know, just to plug my point earlier, as a clinician, 
this is where you can interface because you can say, okay, this is great. This made a wonderful paper. You know, some really fabulous journal wants to publish it because of my results. But tomorrow when I go to work, does this make any difference to my life? And, you know, how do, how do we make sure that research is meaningful clinically as well as statistically? Um, so that was just my, my little two cents, but to give it to the floor, um, does anyone want um, to I ask? Just, I just mentioned there, for me, that's the so what factor. So, yeah, I mean, this, we see it so many times, you know, respiratory rates dropped by two breaths per minute. Yes. Like, yeah. Sats have dropped. <laughs> 90, yeah. Sats improved from 96 to 97. <laughs> But the p-value is, is so tiny, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So just going to the to the questions here, I see um, uh, lots of people saying thank you very much. Um, and then I'm just saying here, someone did ask um, at the bottom. Um, I did put my email into the chat. Um, yep. I can see a concept of statistical and clinical significance. Which one would you aim for? Well, I think we might have just addressed that. Is that, you know, I mean, you, you want to have something meaningful on both sides, quite frankly. Uh, something that, that, I mean, it, ultimately we serve our patients. Um, so whatever we do should, should have some kind of meaningful impact on them. So we start with the statistical and then we ask ourselves, does it have real world implications, I think. And again, the 90% um, confidence interval does combine them. So if you're presenting your confidence intervals, that gives a much more clinically relevant presentation yeah. of your results as well. And, and the then, testing of how yeah. data is normally distributed or skewed. So they are, I mentioned that, so there's the, the Chris Cole Wallace is, is useful. You've got mm -hmm. um, Lilipors, Kolmogorov, Smirnoff. If you look at your, your stats package, um, you will find that it's normally when under, depending on which package you're using, under your descriptive statistical analysis where you just you're describing it and you can just you throw your continuous data at it and it produces histograms um, and gives you a significant result or not and if it's significant it's not normally